Hello and welcome to another short video for the 12 Lead ECG I've Got Rhythm Facebook group. In this case study we will be looking at a patient who presented with signs and symptoms of stroke and how that affected their ECG. This call was to a patient in his 80s who had woken in the morning and was unable to get out of bed. He was complaining of a headache and presented with slurred speech, drooped mouth, eye deviation and obvious left-sided hemiplegia with incontinence of urine. The patient's past medical history was of recent cardiac bypass graft and mitral valve repair. That was followed a few days later by a pacemaker. So should you bother with an ECG? Well, in this case we did. So let's take a look at it. The rate is about 72 and is sinus in origin. There is a slightly long PR interval of just over 200 milliseconds as measured by the computer, hence the borderline first degree block. Axis is leftwards, the QRS is wide at 120 milliseconds and the QTC is prolonged. We have a dominant R wave in V1 with widespread secondary ST T wave changes. You may also have noticed there is no sign of activity from the implanted pacemaker. We will come back to the pacemaker issue later, but for now we are going to start with the dominant R wave in V1. And because this patient is not a child or young adult, let's consider some of the causes for the abnormality. Incorrect lead placement, posterior MI, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, right ventricular hypertrophy and right bundle branch block were a few of the possibilities. We can rule out lead placement as this was checked and correct. The patient's presentation of stroke takes us away from MI. There is no history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and in right ventricular hypertrophy we would expect to see um, right axis deviation over 110 degrees and a QRS duration below 120 which is the opposite of what we have here. We do though have a broad QR wave in V1 and slurred S waves in V6 and lead 1 which gives us the right bundle branch block. However none of this explains the dramatic and very obvious inverted and symmetric T wave in V2. So what could be causing it? Well let's go back to the patient's presentation of having a stroke and consider cerebral T waves. Severe insult to the central nervous system can cause deep, symmetric T wave inversions. It's usually found in more than one lead, but not always, and prolonged QT interval can also be present. So why do we see these changes on an ECG when the problem is in the brain? Well, cardiovascular complications are common after a brain insult and are associated with an increase in circulating hormone catecholamine and inflammatory responses. These are not the only changes that can be seen on an ECG, but their presence should make you consider cerebral T waves. In fact, cerebral insult has also been shown to cause ST elevation and can present as a STEMI mimic. In this study of ECG changes and its relation to mortality in cases of cerebrovascular accidents, T wave inversion was equally distributed between strokes caused by ischemia and those of hemorrhage. You can also see that ST elevation was found in about 10% of cases from both causes. But what of this patient? Well, he was confirmed to have suffered a non-hemorrhagic stroke and was admitted to the hyperacute stroke unit following a scan shortly after arriving at the hospital. Another ECG recorded nine minutes after this one did in fact show the patient's pacemaker in action. And here it is for comparison. You can see how the pacemaker totally changes the morphology of the QRS complexes from our first ECG. Let me put them together to show you how different they are. And there we are. Although this was not a cardiac patient and the patient received a 12 lead as part of their overall assessment, what this does show is that one should never just record a single 12 lead ECG and that continuous monitoring should be standard procedure when undertaking them. On to some take home points then. Having a pacemaker doesn't mean that recording a 12 lead ECG is pointless. History is the key. Remember, treat the presenting complaint, not the ECG. Neurological presentations can and do cause changes to a 12 lead ECG. So if you do one, expect to find some abnormalities. Cerebrovascular accidents are also STEMI mimics, so don't be fooled. And as we always say, continuous monitoring is a must. Now all that's left for me to do is list the references and to say thank you for watching. Hopefully you found this both interesting and helpful. Goodbye for now.